Well, hello, everybody. I think I've actually been here more than once. I think I was here to do a book uh, study on Hebrews. Do you remember that? I did, yeah, I did Hebrews here, and I also did some teaching on resurrection for the Easter conference. So this is my third visit to Prince George. It's a long distance to come, but we have a beautiful weekend. The weather is gorgeous, so it's nice to be with you. We look forward to the time we have together and trust the Lord will bless our meditation His word. Um, as you can see by the slide behind you, what I have for you tonight uh, or all this conference is to talk about what is an assembly. What is an assembly? And it seems to me that sometimes we come to an assembly for maybe several years we attend an assembly and sometimes we might lose sight of what the real function and purpose of an assembly is. Um, I think we just grow used to the habit of coming to church, gathering together as a church. And sometimes we can think, well, I've gone to church, I've listened to the sermon, I remembered the Lord, said my prayers, I've done what I'm supposed to do. And somewhere in amidst all of that, I think we lose sight of the actual function, the purpose for which God gathers us together. So we're going to do some messages on what is an assembly, and we'll look at different aspects of what assembly is. And our first message is going to be entitled, The Assembly is a Testimony. The Assembly is a Testimony. So um, for this, we're going to look at a text in Revelation. So our first text is taken from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Um, I don't know. Can you read that from there? Can you see the text okay? Might be a bit small, but hopefully you can see it. Um, I think I'm using uh, English Standard Version. If you have the King James, it might read a little bit differently. But just before we read the Word of God, I think it's wise to pray and ask God to open our hearts and our understanding to His Word. So let's join together in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we come before you, dependent upon you for all good spiritual food. We know that if anything is to benefit from our meeting together this evening, it is because the Holy Spirit is in it, empowering, directing not only the speaker, but those who listen. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, we'd hear your voice, and we would go away changed. Not that we go away saying that was a nice sermon, but rather we go away determined to be obedient to your word. So, Father, we pray that you'll be with us and bless us, encourage us, give us attentive minds and hearts, and help the speaker who depends on you for the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this passage says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but have this against you. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this I have, this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. Now we're talking about the church as a testimony. A testimony, a lampstand, something that holds light. Now our Lord speaks to the church at Ephesus, and he speaks to six other churches in Asia, and he speaks of them as a lampstand. It's a metaphor. It helps us to learn something about the nature of the local church, and that is that it is to be a light, a bearer of light. The lampstand is something that holds light and casts light forth. That's its function. And if we lose that function, we've lost our meaning and purpose. So the Old Testament tabernacle is where he is alluding to. In the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, we have 
the lampstand in the tabernacle. And that um, lamp was to be lit every night. And the priests were to monitor it and keep it lit all night. Therefore, uh, you could see certain objects inside. You could see the candle itself, which was made of one solid molded piece of gold. And that's very important to understand the unity within the body of Christ. Because it represents the testimonies, the individual testimonies, but we're all joined together. There are three branches coming out on either side, but the middle is the stem, like a vine that uh, joins together from the root or the main trunk from which life flows. And so these are representative of the church and its witness. So this um, lampstand cast light at night when it was dark, and it cast light not only in the candlestick, but it shone across to the other side of the tabernacle, the holy place, and it shone light on the table of showbread. All these things were made out of gold, acacia wood covered with gold. So you saw a nice shiny reflection on the gold, but on that table was bread, and the bread speaks to us of God's provision for life. Without food, we can't live. And of course, it's a picture of the Lord Jesus. Without him, we can't have spiritual life. The bread of heaven came down to give us life. It also shone on the altar of incense. On the altar of incense, there was fine spices that were crushed small, and they were burned as incense on that altar. And it speaks of Christ enduring suffering, and that being a fragrant offering to God. And that was placed just before the veil. And it speaks to us of Christ suffering for us to make the way accessible for us to enter into the presence of God. Because behind that veil was God's presence represented on the Ark of the Covenant. But there is the veil. When you see that veil, it reminds us that there's a barrier between a holy God and sinful man. That we're not free to enter that place. But through Christ, of course, his body is represented as that veil which was torn which was uh, suffered on the cross for us, and the veil was rent in two, teaching us that the way into God's presence is made available. So this lamp is a gospel witness, isn't it? It's telling us about Christ. It's telling about his suffering. It's telling us about his provision for life. And we are to bear witness of that. We are to be a light. If you snuffed out all the lights, you wouldn't see those things. So as a lampstand, a church is to bear witness to Jesus and his salvation. We are to testify to the world about who he is. And in the tabernacle, we see these things uh, given to us symbolically to teach us about the Lord and about the gospel. So this is what John is referring to when he refers to Ephesus as being a lampstand. A lampstand has a lamp on it, and that lamp has oil in it, and the oil is to burn, the oil being a representation of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit lives in us and we have the life of Christ, then we can bear that light to the world. So um, God wants to shine. He wants to shine not only into our hearts and give a knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He wants that light to shine from us, through us, so that others will receive that light. We live in a dark world. It's getting darker out there, darker all the time, as we see the morality, the laws, of our country change. Here in Canada, things have changed so much since we were here last. Uh, we never heard about all this gender stuff before, but now it's all over the place. And there seems to be a, a work of iniquity that's growing. There's a Thessalonians called a mystery of iniquity. There seems to be a spirit of iniquity working today, and the devil is just doing so much to um, destroy people's lives, children's lives. But we as a as the Lord's people, are to shine forth a testimony for God. We are to be a, a light in this world. And uh, we do that by sharing the gospel with people. So, when we look at the Lord Jesus, he's referred to as that great light. In uh, Matthew it says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, 
On them a great light has dawned. Now Jesus spent much of his time, his ministry, in Galilee, along the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And there he did many miracles. If you remember, he walked on water. He healed many people. He also fed 5,000 men, besides women and children. There may have been 20,000 people who witnessed that miracle when he took two fish, five barley loaves, and he fed thousands of people. So the people in Capernaum, in Bethsaida, in um, Chorazin, all that region, maybe many people representing every community, saw and testified to a light shining. Christ had come, and Christ was shining a great light. But interestingly enough, many people rejected him. After the feeding of the 5,000, um, he gave them some hard words because they were seeking him for food. You remember? He said, you seek me not because you uh, seek me. You're seeking uh, another meal. You want some bread to eat. And so he said, unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no part with me. And then they all left. Many of his disciples left. And he looked at his disciples and said, will you leave? And they said, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. So it's interesting to note that Jesus, for sometimes popular when he's feeding people and doing nice miracles, they all want to see him. But when they don't get what they want, they run away. And even when he was in Nazareth, he went into the synagogue and he was preaching, teaching from Isaiah. And he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they took him out and wanted to throw him off a cliff. So while he was working in this area, he was a light. A light to the Jews, because there were many, many Jewish people. It was those few fishermen were Jews, and they believed on him. But it's also an area where it reaches into Gentile areas. And that's why he says a great light to the Gentiles. The gospel is not just for the lost sheep of Israel. The gospel is for all nations. And it continues today. We are to be light to the Gentiles. Here in Canada, we're Gentiles. Sorry, my daughter's distracting a bit. Don't mind her. <laughs> But anyway, um, we are to be a light and testimony. So we have to ask ourselves, how well are we doing at being a light? When we look at John's Gospel, chapter 1, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light, the true light which gives light to everyone that was coming into the world. Now this is Jesus described as a light. A light means something that reveals, something that provides more information that we had when we were in darkness. As soon as you turn a light on the room, you can see you're receiving more information. That's what Jesus did. He opened our eyes to see the truth. And, but not everybody receives the truth. Men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. And so Jesus came, and notice this, it says, gave light to every man. No man is with, uh, is with excuse because God has sent his light to each of us. In some way he testifies. Sometimes people say, well, what about people that never hear of Jesus? God gives them light. God gives them all light. In Acts chapter 10, we have the story of Cornelius. And you remember, Cornelius was a good man and full of alms. He was always doing good. And because he was a man who feared God and did alms, um, God looked upon him with mercy and sent Peter to his house. Now, Peter was a Jew, and he never would sit and eat with Gentiles, but God showed him not to call unclean what, is, what he's made clean. So Peter, by God's direction, went to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius trusted the Savior. You see how God works? If we respond to the little bit of light he gives us, he will give us more light. In the Old Testament, they didn't know about Jesus dying on a cross, yet they put their faith in what God had revealed to them. It says Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him for righteousness. He didn't understand all the truth of Jesus dying on the cross, but he did say prophetically, God will provide himself a lamb. So all through the Old Testament, those believers, they didn't have the full gospel, but they responded in obedience to the light they were given. And God reckoned them as righteous when they put their faith and obedience to what God had revealed. We're fortunate today because we live in the age of grace where we have seen the full revelation of Scripture. Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ was buried and he rose again from the dead. We have all of that. We know the testimony of Scripture. The Holy Spirit teaches us the truth of it. 
And now we can bear that light, that greater light, into the world so that people can see that light. So how well are we doing at it? Are we lights to our neighbors, to our friends? We have to individually shine that light and corporately as a church shine that light. So what does that mean? Well, let me give you a little bit of my own experience. When I first became a believer, I was at a family function and my brother said to me, why don't you have a beer with me? Now, normally, if I were not saved, I would have gladly had a beer with my brother. I wouldn't have had any conscience about that at all. But when I became a believer, I got more sensitive about the use of alcohol. I didn't want to take beer. It wasn't interesting to me. I wasn't interested, certainly, in being drunk or inebriated. So I said to my brother, please, I'd rather not. I'll drink a Coke with you, but not beer. And he says, but you won't have a beer with your brother? And he, he was kind of put off by that. And I said, well... It's all the same to you. I, I will just drink Coke. But there was something that happened between my brother and I that day, which lingers to this day. Because Christ changed me. He made me new. And now my interests and my lifestyle changed. And I couldn't walk in fellowship with my brother in certain areas. Like we're still brothers. We can still share family time together. But there are certain things that I wouldn't allow in my life, that I would make choices against. And he realized I was different. And I realized that day something had changed between my brother and I. So that's what happens. Now, there are several instances I can think of. Um, someone that knew me quite well in those early years of being saved came to me one day and said, what happened to you? You're different. They had known me before I was saved, and then they saw when I got saved that all I could talk about was the Bible and Christ and why don't you get saved, why don't you come to church? And so they seen a real distinct difference, and the difference was that God had changed me. Now that's light, isn't it? That's light shining. We've got to ask ourselves, is light shining? Is my light still shining today? It was certainly there. People noticed the difference. People knew me before I got saved. Like my brother grew up with me, then he saw a change. I was different. There's a light shining. And we have to ask ourselves as believers, is my light shining? Is it growing dim? Is, do people recognize a difference in me? I remember when I was at work one time, again, years ago, I was working in a naval shipyard in Victoria, and one of the fellows was from the Navy. He'd worked for many years in the Navy. And he called me aside one day. He said, you know, there's something different about this guy. So he pulled me aside on his cigarette break. <laughs> and I went outside. I chatted with him. And he says, Daniel, I've been in the Navy for many years. And I've seen people call themselves Christian. Some of the guys will drink and chase after women and call themselves Christian and hold their Bible up like they're holy people. But he said, you're not like that. You're different. What, what happened to you? I had this wonderful opportunity to just briefly share in those few minutes how God saved my soul. That again is light. Is light. When I first went to that job, I was afraid to carry my Bible at work. Just shy and timid, you know, that fear we get. But after a little while, I got more brave. And I carried my Bible and I read it at lunch and I read with another believer. And people saw, that guy's different. That guy's different. And I went into all kinds of situations because of that. But I believe God uses that. And somehow we have to wear our Christianity so that there's a light shining, so people can see that there's a difference in us, that once we were blind and now we see. And there should be some evidence in our life. And collectively, as a church, when somebody walks through the door, if they're an unbeliever, what do they see in the church? You know, I believe one of the greatest lights we can shine to the unbeliever is our unity. Unity requires that we love each other. If we have petty little differences, little things that bother us about our brother or sister, oh, they're always late, why are they always late? You know, we have these little petty things in our mind that bother us. But if we can truly humble ourselves, put away the little grievances, and by the grace of God, just really love our brothers and sisters, and they see the truth of it, not a fake thing, not a fake thing, that we really do care about each other, then the light will shine from us. More than the preacher's words, the preacher can say all he wants, but if there's no light shining, the different life, 
that is the great testimony we have to share with people. When we go into the grocery store, do people look at us and say, are they different? Or are we just like another customer? Maybe there's something in our attitude, something in our words, something in the way we speak to our spouse or our children that demonstrates the life of Christ in us. We should be different from the world. I mean, there's lots of people in the world that are kind and good people and good parents and, and whatnot, but there's a light in us and it causes something different. Sometimes people will see us and we won't even recognize that what they see is light in us. They're seeing it because the Holy Spirit is working and shining through us as we walk close with our Lord and we enjoy him daily. Somehow that joy, that peace, uh, the beauty of Christ will be seen in us. The world longs for something real, longs for something true they can hang on to. Can we demonstrate that to them? In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Of course, Jesus says, you know, your lamp is to be, your light is to be seen to the world. And the only way light has to be seen unless we purposely cover it up, we turn off the light. Now, none of us wants to turn off our light, but sometimes we're a little shy to be very public about our witness for Christ. We're a little afraid because we don't like the persecution we might get or the ridicule we might get. And it's getting more hostile in Canada all the time, as I've noted. So when you truly stand for Christ and mark yourself, I'm a Christian. Yes, I belong to Jesus. I know you don't respect that. You don't think well of it. But I'm willing to stand up and say, I belong to him. He's my savior. Yeah, we might be insulted. We may be thought less of. But somehow that allows that light to shine. We can't hide our light. We can't put it under a bushel. We must let it shine. So we've got to um, do what we can to witness and share the light that we have with others. Um, let's think about the purpose. As a missionary, it's my job to get the gospel out to the people of Ghana. I'm not doing a very good job in Canada, by the way. Pray for me. I've got to be a better missionary in Canada. I haven't been preaching the gospel when I go around, but when I'm in Ghana, I know where I'm at. I know the people, and they're so warm and friendly. They receive the word of God readily, so I, I love it. And, you know, for years, I used to go out on Saturday mornings. Every Saturday morning, I made a concerted effort to go out to some place, some village somewhere, share tracks, talk to people, and try to witness to them. And every time, just so many opportunities. I can't go through it all. It's just amazing opportunities as I meet people and try and share Christ. But then I got married. <laughs> things changed when I got married. My time was busy and had other things and priorities to think about. Scriptures talk about that, don't they? <laughs> when you marry, you're going to be a little busier. But so for a long time, I didn't. But God was faithful. He always brought people to me, and I would share the gospel with people that came to the house or business or whatever. And we were always sharing with people and trying to help them. But I didn't have that concerted Saturday morning evangelism program. And then uh, earlier this year, these three guys got saved um, maybe a year ago, and we baptized them in January. And I wanted to really help these guys grow in their Christian faith, and I really felt a burden to go out and share tracks again. And so I took these guys out. We do evangelism together, and they enjoy it. They love it, and they're being trained, and they're being equipped. And that's what our light should do. It should equip other believers. They should see that we're not afraid to go out and share our faith with other people. One time I was down in that Boulevard Bible Chapel, which is in Florida, and I was just amazed. It's the only time I've seen it in North America where the whole assembly, not the whole assembly, but quite a number, like the elders, a number of families, children, they all went out in a concerted effort to the beach to proclaim the gospel, sing a few songs and preach and hand out tracts. I was so thrilled. That was a collective testimony. Most of the time we send one out or two out, you might be brave enough to go on the street corner and preach. But wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole assembly got together and went out? Because that unity would show that this is important to all of us. We all want the gospel to go forth. So we want to encourage it corporatively and uh, train others in the area of evangelism so that light will shine. So we've been doing that. And 
even in my absence, um, these three guys are going out, but I, I took uh, another uh, man who's a little more mature and does a lot of witnessing himself. And I asked, would you take them out? Because I don't want them to stop. I want them to keep going. And they're doing that. So every Saturday they still go out. So praise God for that. Now, also, one of the ways that we help people find Christ is through our teen class. Um, this is a picture of our teens. And uh, I love this. I love these people. They're young, but many of them are coming to Christ. This is where we see fruit. I've handed out thousands of tracts, preached on the radio for years, tried to witness to lots of people. Praise God for all that bread cast upon the waters. Who knows, some of it may come back someday. But this, this is the place where we see fruit. This is where people are getting saved. When we are thinking about evangelism and we want to see other people saved, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we being effective? Are people hearing and getting saved? If they're not, we have to rethink our methods. We could hand out a million tracts, but if nobody reads them, it's going to do nothing. Sometimes just going to visit somebody can make a big difference. We have to think about the methods, the means. Where is God producing fruit? Where are we going to see some advancement in the gospel? For me, when I'm in Africa, I love working with this class because the little girl, the pretty girl in the pink dress is my niece. That's Givens. She's 15 and she was saved last year. And the boy in the white shirt in the front, Daniel, is one of the elder sons. He's also saved and both of them were baptized last year sometime. And the three boys that I showed you in the last slide, they're also in the picture. They got saved and were baptized this January. So these are the people that we're finding coming to Christ. And the way we work with these people, here's a method for you. We teach them Emmaus Bible courses. I think you're familiar with Emmaus Bible courses, right? Well, now they have it on an app. I would show you, but my phone's recording right now. But on your phone, you can go to the Google Play Store and you can download Emmaus Bible courses. If you're ever talking to somebody and say, hey, you know, I've got a really interesting app where you can learn about the Bible. And it's free. There's no advertisement on it. And you just download that and start working on Bible courses. My wife's done plenty of courses and she continues to work on them all the time. There's over 50 courses in English. I love it. We are now looking after all of West Africa. In other words, when the student completes the course, they get a mark, they fill out the end and they put some um, review there. And in that review, they will maybe make prayer requests or ask questions, or they may, I may see in their answers that there's some fundamental misunderstanding of a doctrine, particularly if they don't get the gospel clearly. They believe in a work salvation rather than grace-based salvation. Then I will address that and I'll write back to the student and give them some feedback. And we have now about 1,200 students across West Africa. So it's a really busy schedule for me. I have an elder in, um, in Edmonton that uh, volunteered to help and praise God for him. He's been a real blessing to help with this ministry. But this is one way that the gospel is getting out to a lot of people. And we have tremendous opportunity to help people hear the gospel and be clear on it. As many people in Africa think they're a Christian and going to heaven. But if you ask them why Jesus died, they can't give you a clear answer. So our job as a missionary is just to help them to understand your salvation rests in trusting in Christ and Him alone. That's your only way to get to heaven. So when we think about, for this it works for me and, and for the ministry that I do. But you have to think about what works for me. How can I reach souls? How can I help people come to Christ? Maybe through Sunday school. Do you have any children that come here? Maybe that's one way you see fruit, see kids coming to Christ. Maybe we have to go out there on the streets and find people. Maybe we have to go to some market or something where we can somehow have a presence for the gospel. We must. We have to do this. We have to be a light. Otherwise, we don't answer to what an assembly is, a testimony. If there's no light, there's no testimony. And we'll fade away and the Lord will take away that lamp. So we have to think carefully about that. So in this passage that I read from Ephesians, there's a danger of a loss of light. The Lord said they had to repent. What did they have to repent of? Now they were doing lots of good things in Ephesus. Let's understand that. If you walked into this church and said, wow, there's a lot going on here, a lot of good things. But the one thing that he held against them was they left their first love. Now, we don't know exactly. He doesn't tell us exactly what that is. We can speculate. Was it a, a loss of love for the gospel? Maybe. I suspect it might be. 
that can often happen in our lives. We get comfortable in our Christianity. We get comfortable in our weekly church gatherings, and we forget about the peril of the lost, that people are dying every day without Christ. And we're not bearing up our responsibility to shine that light brightly for the people that need it. So we need to love the lost. But it, could it be that they lost love for one another? That's, that's the power of our light is in our love for one another, you know. When we love one another, people come in and they see that you're squabbling and quibbling and, you know, complaining about this person, that person, the, the light's gone out. The light's gone out. The greatest thing that we can give to people and show them is that tra Christ transforming power, God is love. And God spreads his love abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And we need to care about one another. We need to love one another. When God does that in our life, we really care about people, one another in the church. We start there, our families, whoever it is. When we really exhibit love, then the light will shine. God's light will shine. And people will see that. And God will put them in that pathway to see that light. But if we're too busy with our own affairs and we don't really care and we're, we're complaining and we just live like our neighbors who are unsaved, we're not going to have any light. We need to be careful that we, we love. You know, love comes from the Lord, right? Love comes from the Lord. And I guess when it comes down to it, these people lost their love for the Lord. I'm not saying completely, but that first burning passion, when they first knew him, when they first got saved, they just wanted to tell the world about Jesus. They wanted to love the saints. And I think of my own experience. I use myself as an example. When I first saved, I couldn't put the Bible down. I wanted to love everybody. I wanted to make a difference for Christ. And I was zealous for the gospel. First thing I did is I went out and bought some Bibles. I had them embossed with my family's name, and I sent them all the Bible. So I figured, well, I got saved by reading the Bible. Maybe they'll get saved. I just thought it's that simple, you know. Well, it wasn't that simple. It took 10 years of prayer. But God finally broke through with his light. And to my sister's heart, then my dad, my mom, they all got saved. Praise God. But we need to love him and not lose our love for him because if we love him, we will love his people and we will love the gospel. We will share it with other people. So we re repent and do the first works. Go back to the way it was. If you can remember a day in your Christian life when it was better, when you loved him more and you were more zealous for good works, repent. Go back to that day. Do it again. If you could go out and witness for him when you were 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years younger, <laughs> then renew that zeal. It's worth it. The greatest thing we can do in our life is to love Jesus. The greatest reward for come, come from that. Everything else in this life is vanity. It's just going to pass through our hands and be gone. And soon we'll be with him in glory. And we don't want to make the mistake of not giving him our best where he gave us his best. You know, the light did get removed. This is a picture from the Ark of um, Titus, Titus Ark, I think it's called, and it's um, in Rome, and it was erected in AD 81 after the death of Titus to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem. And you'll notice in this sculpture, this relief, that there's a picture of the uh, candle, the candlestick, right, that they took away. Now, the Jews lost their light, didn't they? They lost it depicted for everybody to see down through the generations because when the light came to them, they rejected the light. They said, we will not have this man reign over us. They didn't want him. They rejected their Messiah. And so the Lord Jesus prophesied, oh, one stone will be left on another. And they're in blindness right now. God loves them and he will save them in the end. But how tragic that so many have missed the mark, have fallen short of receiving all that he wants to give them because they did not respond to the light that was given to them. So as we close, um, we want to think about our responsibility. You know, we want to be like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an odd character. He didn't dress kind of so well, didn't eat so well, kind of hung out with the uh, animals in the wilderness. It's a strange character, but one thing about him is the Lord Jesus spoke very well of him. He said, of all men born of women, 
there is none greater than John the Baptist. And he is called a burning and shining lamp. A burning and shining lamp. For John, for some reason, he was different. He just said, as for me, I'm going to dedicate everything to testifying about this man that comes after me. This great one who I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And so he used his life in that way. And so Paul exhorts the believers in Ephesus and says, for at one time you were darkness. Is that not true? All of us who are here who have experienced salvation know that once we were lost in darkness, I'm so grateful God shone the light into my heart. And he opened my heart to know Christ. Where would I be today? Where would I be a hundred years from now? If not for his mercy, if not for his goodness, to shine his light into my heart and give me life. Once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Let the light shine. Let others see Christ in you. The assembly is a testimony. We are collectively a testimony. Let the light shine. Let the gospel go forth. If the gospel doesn't go forth from Kelly Road, Gospel Chapel, is that what you call it? Gospel Chapel? Then soon the light will go out. Do I speak to your heart? Do you realize the truth of that? I know many assemblies. I've been in traveling around, and there are some assemblies really struggling. And they're wondering if they're on their last legs. It doesn't have to be so. There can be one or two left. But if we trust him, and we do what he says, and we let the light shine, let our love be manifest, and God will renew the work, rekindle the fire. Maybe we'll see a flood of people come in. Maybe all the seats will be filled in Sunday morning for worship. You won't have enough seats because you were faithful. But you said, Lord, I want to be that light. I want others to see Christ. I want them to know him. But if we can't do that, I fear that many assemblies will close down. Let's be challenged. Let's not let Kelly Road light go out. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've come before you. We thank you for the word of God, which exhorts us, encourages us, comforts us, teaches us, which leads us ever closer to Christ. Father, we need you. We need your strength and help and grace to do this. You've given us light and we're so grateful, but help us not to be hiding that light under a bushel. Help us to let it shine. Father, in whatever way we can, we're not perfect. We know there is problems in our life. Sometimes we're lazy. Sometimes we're just not obedient. But Father, we pray that you would humble our hearts before your presence and help us to see the importance of shining the light. And let us, by your grace, somehow, some way, touch a life and bring them closer to the Savior. We pray you will fill this place with new believers and those who would say, what must I do to be saved? Oh, Father, it would be our joy, it would be our delight to tell them about the Lord Jesus and how he died to put away their sin, who loves them enough to give them eternal life and forgiveness. So, Father, we just ask for your gracious help. Help the saints here to see that they are a testimony and to uphold the light of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Oh, absolutely. Let's uh, thank the Lord for our pizza. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do thank you for our body's nourishment. We ask you to bless this food to us and our fellowship together as we talk on these things that we might resolve in our heart how to go from here and do better. We just pray and ask your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
I think it is, um, I don't, for some reason, I only thought you'd been here two times. Well, you said one. Huh? Did you say one? Two. You said one. No, it's a two. Second.